Uh, let's move on now to uh, l'Ombudsman de l'Ontario, Maître André Marin. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, for those who are not familiar with, with what an Ombudsman is, let me just give you the Coles Note version of it. Uh, the Ombudsman of Ontario is uh, one of uh, several ombudsmen across Canada who are parliamentary ombudsmen, which means that I'm appointed by vote of the Legislative Assembly. Our office was created in 1975, and we oversee over 500 different government uh, agencies, bodies, quasi-judicial tribunals. While the office has tremendous investigative ability, we can subpoena people under oath, we can sign our own search, search warrants, incredible investigative authority that I'm not aware of any other body uh, that enjoys these uh, tools in society. But at the end of the day, we only make a recommendation. Therefore, advocacy, moral suasion are key to the implementation of our recommendations. An invisible ombudsman is an ineffective ombudsman. Since my appointment in 2005, we've tackled some extremely uh, difficult, uh, high-profile issues uh, with very uh, colorful titles, colorful language in order to exercise those advocacy skills. And it's not always easy. You know, when we go and we fend for newborn babies and we ask for more screening to save babies' lives, we're pretty much on the side of the angels. But our last investigation was about the uh, undue force being exercised by prison guards on inmates. And that's not an easy topic because the public's uh, view is not very sympathetic to prisoners, right? You did the crime, do the time. And so the challenge we had in the code is to uh, really bring home the seriousness of the issues we investigated, including the case of Colin. And Colin was uh, someone who uh, was reported to have fallen in his jail cell. Well, the real story we investigated was something very different. Uh, Colin was a uh, prisoner with a mental illness who, after getting a severe beating by prison cards, sustained a brain injury and uh, several facial lacerations, broken bones, teeth, for doing absolutely nothing. And so uh, when we talk about prisoners' complaints, we don't talk about uh, wilted lettuce complaints or, you know, toast that are uh, burnt or prisoners not getting haircuts before going to court. We were talking about some pretty serious things. And so it was important for us to advocate change within uh, the uh, prison system in Ontario. And we did that by really, uh, with, of course, Colin's consent, by using his face, blowing it up. This is serious stuff. And you need to address the cover-up by prison guards. We need to uh, get rid of the collusion to hide what was happening in the prison system. We need to get prison guards to uh, follow through and follow the process and not use prisoners as punching bags. And so we, of course, took advantage of the fact that we had uh, Colin's participation to illustrate the seriousness of the issue the media coverage when we released the, what we call the code of silence, because that is what we had in Ontario to uh, cover up these beatings that were happening on a far too frequent uh, basis. We uh, had a press conference and it was very well received and all our recommendations, 45 of them were accepted, which included the creation of a special internal criminal investigative body to investigate of physical abuse by prison guards against inmates. In my prior uh, job, I was the military ombudsman from 1998 to 2005. You can see a very youthful face. Uh, it's a little bit when you see pictures of Obama and he's got black hair and now it's all white. Well, there you go. I look like I'm about 12 years old. Um, now getting to uh, the, the topic of hand about the uh, history between the lawyers and the media, uh, as was indicated uh, quite uh, eloquently by Simon in the introduction, we've seen a complete evolution, the turning around of that approach. And um, we have to realize that the 
best interests of clients and common sense must guide us in the dealing with the media. Nowadays, we have a climate where the courts are opening up many, many things to the media. If you look at information to obtain search warrants, we read about them all the time in the newspapers. They come out in dribs and drabs. That used to be sacrosanct, protected. Now there's applications, they're made public. And as these information obtained search warrants come out in dribs and drabs, it amounts to essentially a death by a thousand cuts in the media. So lawyers cannot just sit idly by as their, uh, as their clients are getting eviscerated. They have, to, they have to step up and uh, defend the interests of their client. Now, I don't know this lawyer. Uh, his name is uh, De Dennis Morris. I tried to call him this week to tell him he'd be in my presentation. Um, maybe he's on Twitter and he'll follow me live to even realize that he is in my presentation. But I'll tell you why I admire this lawyer. I've never met him. But the reason why I admire him is because he represents the most difficult client you could probably imagine uh, that you have to manage in the media. You guessed it. There he is. The man who needs no introduction. Rob Ford. Now that was actually him two weeks ago in a park. Um, straight out of rehab where he purportedly lost a ton of weight, but I just, I don't see it. Um, you know, when I say the most difficult to client to manage in the media, imagine having to deal with a client who's portrayed like this in the media, yet has never been charged with a crime, uh, except when he jaywalked in Vancouver. And he's doing all these things in Toronto, he's never going to charge, he goes to Vancouver and he gets nabbed for jaywalking when he was at a conference last year. And I'll tell you why I admire uh, the approach of Dennis Morris in the media is that he's having to deal with extremely serious allegations against his client, but he, uh, he's done that in a very deaf, deft way where he talks about uh, there's no video showing him smoking crack cocaine. You could see the, the paraphernalia, but who knew what was in that actual a pipe, and this is way before we knew what we know now. Here he is, no one could say what's in the pipe. Calling the police investigation a continued waste of taxpayers' money, which of course in Toronto, everyone talks about the gravy train, so that's a very well, good way to connect with the public. Of course, Dennis Morris was always very, and he continues to be very effective in talking about uh, Rob Ford's uh, weight training program. Now, I don't know that that's relevant to anything, but it's very effective in distracting the public and reminding them that he's just an ordinary obese guy trying to get in shape. Now, the second video emerges. Now, how do you do uh, damage control on this one? Now, last week, about 10 days ago, the story comes out that Rob Ford will be subpoenaed in the trial of another person charged with a criminal offense. And I really um, admired how Dennis Morris dealt with that because, of course, because he's subpoenaed, it made him uh, part of the criminal conspiracy, right? I mean, ceux qui s'assemblent se ressemblent. So there was immediate suggestion, oh, he's being subpoenaed. So he, it's something uh, really bad. And Dennis Morris basically deflated this, again in the interest of his client, by saying basically if they want to subpoena the mayor, they're going to, and it's just a matter of where and when. It's not like you're not willing to be subpoenaed. It just has to be the right time and place. It's just like going on a date. If today doesn't work, make it tomorrow. So again, there's a very, uh, I think, very deft way to refocus, reposition the issue. That in a way that ordinary people who are following the media can relate to. So it's this kind of folksy charm, folksy style of his lawyer that no one can really find offensive, but has reframed the issue over and over and over. And to this day, Rob Ford is still not charged. And I think, I mean, you gotta work with what you have. 
this is his client. You can't uh, uh, turn it into gold, but you can manage it in such a way as to protect and enhance your client's um, reputation and make sure he has his best foot forward. Right now, uh, Rob Ford's back in the election in Toronto, and it's a three-way race, and who knows? Stranger things have happened. Now, the other lawyer that I think I, I, uh, I admire, and I know, Julian Faulkner, who's made a career out of representing families of people killed by police in uh, or uh, dying in custody, and as well has done a lot of work in uh, dealing with the lack of Aboriginal jury trial, jurors on trial in Ontario courts. Uh, I mean, take one of his quotes here, dealing with a police shooting. There is a recognition, a historical recognition, that the police use of lethal force when they take the lives of mentally disabled men, such as in this case, when they take the steps they do, it has a profound impact on our social fabric. For that, their price, their responsibility, it is undeniably and absolutely accountable, and it is sad that these families had to bear the burden, the task of getting this job done. It shouldn't fall to them. Again, not offensive, not objectionable, but certainly uh, putting those families in a, casting them in a very good light and helping create sympathy for his client. I always believe that it's important to define the issue before the issue defines you. In this case, in Ontario, there's a bill, Bill 8, which is about to expand the jurisdiction of my office in a pretty vast fashion, giving me jurisdiction over 444 municipalities, including municipal council. Huge expansion, it should probably double the size of our office. The mayor of Ottawa uh, takes offense to that, does not want to have me looking over his shoulders, I don't blame him. Uh, and uh, he took to Twitter to criticize Bill 8 and uh, talk about the need to, how it duplicates things, how it's bureaucratic, how it will embroil uh, the uh, city in all types of problems, and I took to Twitter to respond to it in a very quick way to not allow him to define the issue, which I, which I put on Twitter was uh, electioneering on his part. I'm gonna wind this down with a couple of tips on how to deal with the media in a pre-court uh, case, because that's obviously what I've talked about this morning. You need the consent of your client before going public, of course. And you need to plan your sound bites. Don't ever just go cold turkey. Think, what is your strategy? What do I want to achieve? How will I not get in trouble with the law societies uh, or the courts? Uh, stick to the message. Again, Rob Ford's lawyer has been very consistent. Stick to the message. Don't say no comment, because if you say no comment, it implies that you have a lot to say, and there's something fishy. Always better to explain why you will not comment. Don't go off the records, the record rather. Know your facts and figures. Very important that you do not embellish or exaggerate, and attack the position and not the person. Don't make it personal. Take the high road at all, at all, at all times. We in our office have a very active and aggressive social media um, and media approach and I encourage you, if you're not following us on social media, to uh, please do, we welcome you. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Merci, Monsieur um, I'm wondering, you know, so many things I find that have come up from all of your comments. And one thing that's re resonated with me is sort of the emotion of law and the emotion of lawsuits and, um, and how clients feel, um, you know, about going through a lawsuit and what they're feeling going through a lawsuit. And I really do believe that as lawyers, we do forget that uh, uh, often. Um, I just, I was in private practice for a long time and then recently have gone to public, uh, to a public interest uh, type of situation where there is a communications department. And I have found it interesting how, what a, sort of a, a gut reaction I had against 
the communications department and when they're trying to put forward a message of the, the lawsuits that we're involved in, uh, and they're not lawsuits, they're complaints, I'm with the Canadian Human Rights Commission, but we are in a public interest role often with regard to complaints. Um, but I think as a lawyer, you just sort of have this uh, sort of pushback to what the communications department's trying to do, which is really come to the essence of the complaint and really, I guess, strip it down to what it's about. And I'm wondering if you have um, some comments on that, on how we can do that better as lawyers uh, in terms of our, how we write uh, our case, you know, how we do our written arguments, how we plead our arguments, the use of persuasion, the use of emotional issues within the persuasive part of the case, um, and how that would interact with our legal theory, so to speak. Yes, thank you. So the question was uh, from the Canadian Human Rights Commission and uh, the cautiousness with which lawyers deal with communication issues and how to make it easier uh, for lawyers to um, connect with the communication side of your office. And I think as lawyers, we suffer from a uh, déformation professionnelle. I don't know how to say that in English. But basically, we're, we're, we're taught to uh, be cautious with the media, to be very conservative, the risks uh, involved with anything we say or do. It's something we need to cope with. Now, being with a public body, especially one that deals with human rights, you're always on a, in a position to have to demonstrate your value. If you don't demonstrate your value to the public, to people on the outside, you risk becoming irrelevant. When I became ombudsman in 2005, I'd just been appointed, I was very excited, went to work, the first letter on my desk was from the Deputy Minister Council of Ontario. All this, the Deputy Ministers that gather once a week to talk about running the province. And it was signed uh, that they were recommending the elimination of the Ombudsman's Office. The Ombudsman's Office was so low profile, it was running under the radar. The Premier wanted uh, extra cash for his uh, priorities and they figured they could just get rid of the office and no one would notice. So now you see today, uh, it's not in the cards because of the visibility of the office. And so very much your kind of office has that similarity to our office, is that you have to always put your best foot forward to demonstrate that you are relevant, you have value to your stakeholders. And if you look at that angle, you should be able to better cope with a communication strategy which enhances your office and uh, deals with your deformation professionnelle.